Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, time to begin our last lecture. This is the last time we do this live session and um, we will finish up with Friedrich Nietzsche today who, like I said, um, is probably a good philosopher to um, finish the class with. Um, well, not everyone is here yet, but uh, before we get to Nietzsche, just one more thing I wanted to say for the next fall, uh, just to let you guys know, the schedules are now being finalized and it looks like um, I will be teaching uh, four sections actually of Philosophy 102. I don't know if you guys need 102, if you took 102, a lot of students need 102. Um, I know there's at least one student here who actually did take it with me already. But if you do, keep that in mind. Uh, there'll be one online session and section and three hybrid sections. Basically, what does that mean? It means that we will meet in the classroom. <laughs> Hopefully, they're not going to cancel that. We'll be meeting once a week instead of twice a week. Uh, but nonetheless, so part of it will be online, but we will be meeting in person and I will be explaining the material We'll do exercises, so if you need this class, um, there is very few of these sections, at least the way it is right now, unless they change it, which are taught in person. Other than me, there's just one more. Um, all of them are actually at West Charleston. I don't know if it's convenient to anybody or not. Nonetheless, that's kind of a good news you may want to uh, think about. So when registration opens hopefully soon again I don't think they even came up with the date yet but they should come up rather soon uh, it will probably fill up quickly because uh, my guess is most students do want to go back to the classroom it doesn't seem like there is any special requirement so far I don't know if they'll come up with it later but right now they don't even require any vaccination or anything it's just um, um, taught normally more or less maybe by the fall they will change that but uh, right now that's the way it is okay uh, we will talk more about the final exam and the grades in the end of, end of class so make sure you are sticking till the end if you are interested a lot of it I already told you but I want to repeat it and re-emphasize some important points which you again should know because, like I said, that's the last time we meet. So you may want to one, know certain things about the final exam and your grades. But before that, let's get back to Nietzsche. So remember, Nietzsche's philosophy, and we talked about last time, perspectivism. The, there's no truth. There's just different perspectives. That's what Nietzsche is saying. It's kind of a battle of perspectives. And since there is no truth, there also is no God. Uh, we should abandon all our metaphysical hopes, Nietzsche is telling us. Again, remember what metaphysics is. Hopefully you got that from the class. Um, it's part of philosophy which deals with these questions of ultimate reality, ultimate truth, uh, meaning, and so on. Um, things which we care about a lot but can't really investigate them using some sort of scientific method. Now Kant already has put it into kind of a um, put it aside in a sense. Remember for Kant all these metaphysical questions cannot be answered. Nonetheless he said that it helps us to get through life um, kind of project into this sort of thing a certain viewpoint that there is after all God and there is after all freedom of the will we will never know it for sure but Kant thought that if we have good reason to at least live as if they exist now Nietzsche already tells us no abandon that abandon this hope uh, it's a lie so another good quote from Nietzsche the true world true world an idea which is no longer good for anything, an idea which has become useless and superfluous. Consequently, a refuted idea, 
let us abolish it. We only show our weakness when we come up with these metaphysical stories. We are trying to find some certainty in an uncertain world. world. But Nietzsche rejects all that um, as pointless. He does refer to himself as anti-metaphysician for this reason. Rejects metaphysics. Now, what does that mean for us? What happens? Well, he does mention homelessness many times. Homelessness in the sense that we're wandering in this world um, not knowing why are we here and what are we doing. And he's saying we can't know that because there's really no answers to that. Um, the values that give life meaning evaporated. The world, of course, seems colder. It's more desolate. It's more abandoned. We feel like we've been left out. That, what he calls a spiritual nomadism. Nomadism as in, you know, nomads uh, wandering around, have no home. And in spiritual sense, he's saying that's how we are, human beings. And um, that is, of course, something new for us, too, because um, we were carrying this belief in God for centuries. In medieval times, people were committed to belief in God, to religion. But um, according to Nietzsche, um, today, well, he's writing that in the end of the 19th century, we can say that um, there is no God. He calls it the death of God. In one of his works, he's saying the, gre the greatest recent event that God is dead, but the belief in the Christian God has become unbelievable, is already beginning to cast its shadows over Europe. Now, naturally, he does not mean that God, this eternal being, literally has died. Um, he means that our trust in God has died. The age of secularism. Theism, belief in God, played a decisive role in the development of civilization. But um, Nietzsche is saying it's no longer the case. We are moving towards the age where people will no longer find the notion of God relevant to their culture. That's what the death of God means. The notion of God no longer relevant. Now, how do we live with all that? Uh, he's saying that, of course, that will require a lot from us. And there are, he's saying, certain people who are detached from culture, detached from all of that, and are waiting on the mountains. And they can see that, and he's one of those people. But not everybody can see that. Um, why does he, does he think there is no God? He's saying, well, you really don't need any proof that there is no God. Um, there's another quote. Formerly, it was sought to prove that there is no God. Now it is shown how the belief that a God existed could have originated and by what means this belief gained authority and importance. In this way, the counterproof that there is God, no God, becomes unnecessary and superfluous. So what he's saying really is um, we can show how people invented God and therefore that refutes the idea of God on itself. You do not necessarily need to prove anything. Now, that actually is not the strongest argument. In fact, it's a bit of a fallacy, genetic fallacy. You are trying to refute something by saying, uh, well, this is how this belief originated. Therefore, it is refuted. But it's a little bit more subtle than this in that case. Uh, obviously, that does not remove the idea of God um, as a certain presence a certain entity because um, there could be different ways to understand that. What it does actually remove is the idea of God 
as any particular religion tells us uh, about God. So what he more or less refuting is not God uh, in some sort of an extra sense, but God as it is seen in the Bible, Quran, or whatever other uh, holy book. Okay, the way people think they understand it. So, if there is some other way to understand what God is, then of course you cannot refute it by merely saying that uh, we know how this belief originated. Uh, but any particular belief, in particular if you take, let's say, Christianity, and if you look at uh, what was happening with first Old Testament and so on, he's saying that the way these beliefs developed, uh, we can explain it rather easily through history by events other than divine intervention, by simply human need to uh, fulfill certain purpose. Okay, let's talk about it a little bit. So what do you think of the Nietzsche's claim that the notion of God is no longer a viable cultural fo force? Now, we obviously live about 140 years after he wrote most of his work, so we have <laughs> a little bit of a different perspective, but um, do you find his argument against God, the ex existence of God, persuasive? Do you think that... May yeah, religion is very much thriving today, that is true. Um, that uh, belief in um, some sort of divinity seemed to be indeed fulfilling certain purpose for human beings and therefore uh, never really goes away. Although you can also see, uh, if you remember the history right, of the 20th century, that there's a certain point to that because there certainly were a lot of people, especially soon after Nietzsche's death, and remember he died in 1900, who uh, probably were not very religious. The communism and the uh, socialism, socialist countries immediately comes to mind. Remember, Marxist uh, teaching became very popular and that is uh, materialism. Uh, when I grew up, and I grew up actually in the Soviet Union during the communist days, uh, we certainly did not have um, religion in our life there was there were churches and some people would go there, but it was pretty much completely removed from the state. In school, they would never ever talk about that. There was no talk about God on uh, TV or anywhere else, other than in a dismissive way, like uh, "ha ha ha," that's uh, such a nonsense. So the only way you could like become religious, and some people were, is like through your parents, grandparents, and if you had some sort of interest in that, you can go in church by yourself, but you would never ever um, have any kind of um, official recognition of this. So despite that, religion did kind of um, um, remain and it thrived right as soon as communism collapsed. In the early 90s, when the communism finally collapsed in Russia, um, suddenly First, there were some very strange uh, religious beliefs popping out and people believing in weird stuff. They would have like um, some prophets on TV giving advice and uh, sending some energy and whatever. But then uh, people kind of gravitated towards more traditional Orthodox Church to beliefs which Russian people had before the revolution, before 1917. Uh, turned out that most people um, never really abandoned. But for a long time still, it was kind of um, pushed aside. Similarly, in many other countries, in Germany, for example, you can see that during the World War II, Germany was um, very, very um, atheist in a sense, because certainly Hitler and the Nazis did not believe in God, did not care about God. That was nothing to them. Uh, and again, even though there certainly were German people who probably went to church and continued believing, but nonetheless, that was not um, recognized officially, it did not play any role in the life of the state. Right? And some may say that's maybe one of the reasons for 
the world war itself because people became a lot less atheistic so they did not believe anymore that if they kill other people there will be any kind of retribution for that uh, if you kill millions it's just the statistics and that certainly is what hitler believed right because he did in fact kill millions of jews and uh, didn't feel any remorse about that so you can see how nietzsche's morality nietzsche's philosophy in particular could play a role there too right because uh, he is saying there's no morality he's saying there's no god and even though he never uh, said you can kill millions of people but you can see how somebody like hitler who actually um, hated jews and wanted to murder them would say okay well that's a wonderful religion uh, i mean that's a wonderful philosophy i can subscribe to that certainly there's no religion there is no god and if you kill if you want to kill millions of people just go ahead build uh, some stuff and uh, do that so that was his thinking um right well um because when no more people believe in god god in a sense has no power well god is all powerful right we do say that he certainly does have power at all points uh, any religion basically says that god of course can do whatever god um, doesn't interfere with our freedom of the will but he can interfere with our actions so for example he could have killed hitler easily right hitler um, when he was still for example a soldier during world war one could have been hit by a bullet and that's it no hitler since god knows ahead of time what will happen um, there really is no reason that something would prevent him from doing that so god still is in control and that's the same old problem of good and evil you would ask well if he's so perfectly good why is he allowing that and we already went through these explanations but uh, nonetheless it's not so much to do with god's power it is with what people actually believe and if people believe there is no god then of course they act differently than if they do believe that there is god or do they because a lot of people actually say well okay people who believe in god murder others too and commit all sorts of crimes i mean just look at the for example all the scandals uh related to catholic church i'm sure you guys have heard about that all these priests who molest little boys i mean what is that how do these people believe in god that's like i'm always wondering what can be in the head of a person like this uh, it's not even the regular person it's a catholic priest right catholic priest a person who dedicated his life to god how he justifies to himself what he is doing how can anybody justify that never mind the priest um well there must have been some kind of justification right because they are doing that that's a fact there are many many of them has been caught um and catholic church had to explain it somehow so you know what what, what is going on uh, well clearly people can believe in god and do horrible things in the same time there's really no reason why they could not do that Japanese uh, manga comic well obviously Nietzsche is a very popular figure in um, many areas not just in philosophy because his philosophy like I said after his death or even before his death but after he went insane became quite popular and a lot of people read it and so on so naturally there will be all sorts of um, even movies like very recent movie by the way lou uh about lou salome if you guys are interested um, just released recently it talks about her relationship with nietzsche among other things it's not specifically on nietzsche but nietzsche is there so uh, if you are curious quite an interesting figure lou salome herself was a russian person who um, is one of the first women to get education during the end of 19th century when education was still reserved to men and she went to the university of zurich um, got her degree was interested in philosophy and then met uh, nietzsche and met a number of other uh, interesting people such as a uh, german poet rilke uh, so if you're curious just 
you can watch that. So I don't know if there's a correlation with the uh, manga and comic, but possibly, quite possibly. I mean, they certainly could have uh, people who are uh, doing that, creating that stuff, probably aware of uh, Nietzsche and they may have uh, used it there. Okay, we need to move on now because um, we don't have unlimited time. So what about Jesus? It's an interesting um, to see how Nietzsche talks about Jesus because he kind of um, has this dual attitude there towards Christianity and Jesus. Um, in Jesus, he actually sees um, a very strong person. That's what he said. He says, I admire Jesus. Jesus um, certainly has this personal power which should be admired. He is an inner-directed person, right? He looks inside himself uh, and does not follow anybody. Well, many people may um, wonder how is that. Well, think about it. What does Jesus say about the um, Old Testament, about the belief of the fathers? And remember, he's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about... Um, the Jewish religion in particular, the way it was at the time, right? It, the whole thing was happening in Israel, in um, Jerusalem, around Jerusalem area. And he was reacting in his teaching against what? Against the Jewish religion. And what did he say about it? Well, I'll help you. He said, I came to reject it. Uh, if you read like some of the most important parts of the New Testament, he's saying, well, it says in the Old uh, Bible, if somebody hurts you, you should hurt them back. But I am against that. Well, essentially, don't do that. On the contrary, if somebody hurts you, you should uh, give up even more, give it to them, and so on. So the entire teaching he had went against this official religion, the Jewish religion of the period, which is one of the reasons definitely he was uh, crucified in the first place, because uh, the priests and the religious people hated him. They thought uh, he was submersive to official ideas. So that's uh, what Nietzsche admires here. So to him, Jesus is this kind of a... a revolutionary person, and he's saying, uh, Jesus lived not to redeem man, but to show how one man must live. What does that mean? It means that his life was an example of how we should all live. Um, that's the idea of uh, why he is to be admired. And then very striking thing, he uh, Nietzsche is saying, uh, in truth, he says, there was only one Christian, and he died on a cross. So what he means is the only true Christian was Jesus. But what's the problem with people who then follow Jesus? In particular, um, he's very unhappy about um, Paul and the whole church, Christian, Christian church creation. He's saying these people did not have any inner power. They started just following others they started following what they are told and this is according to Nietzsche is the problem uh, this is no longer Christianity the way Christ lived his life because Christ was not following anybody and if you are following Christ then you are not truly a Christian according to him so note that there is some similarity with what Kierkegaard was saying uh, remember Kierkegaard was criticizing what he called Christendom uh, for this very reason that people go there not to truly be living them, their life in the spirit of Christ. They do it as some sort of a ritual in order to uh, score points, you may say, with others. Uh, look at me. I'm going to church every Sunday. Uh, I'm such a good Christian. right? But in the same time, they are continue sinning. They live in their life as any atheist would do. Uh, and there really is not that much of a difference. In that sense. So if you truly want to live the way Christ lived, you have to do what Christ was doing. And what was he doing? He abandoned all worldly possessions, right? 
he was saying that you cannot be rich, wealthy, uh, if you want to go to the kingdom of God. He uh, was not resisting anyone who was trying to hurt him. He was saying that you have to be meek, you have to submit, submit yourself to others. Now, that is the spirit of Christianity. And if you are not doing that, then of course, according to Nietzsche, you are not truly Christian. Now, this is where again we come back to the will to power. A very important concept to him. Remember the will itself. We already looked at it with Schopenhauer. That's the Schopenhauer idea that there is this will um, which kind of like gives us this energy, pushes us all, and we can feel it all inside ourselves. Except Schopenhauer was saying we should resist it, we should quiet down the will. But Nietzsche is saying no, we should embrace it. Uh, it's the greatest thing. So the will to power is the fundamental psychological force in human life. This is Nietzsche saying what drives you to be better, to achieve stuff, to do stuff. Um, and according to Nietzsche, again, unlike according to Schopenhauer, we should embrace that fact. We should embrace the will to power. What are the manifestations of the will to power? He's saying, well, the saints, for example, including Jesus, uh, they do, of course, have the will to power. It um, is kind of lurking there, except that there is a bit of a problem. They have willpower for all this discipline, um, to discipline their body and mind. It's very difficult. Not everybody can do it. So that shows the will of power right there. But it is somewhat misdirected, because um, that, according to Nietzsche, is even though it takes all this effort, but it does not uh, give you any practical result other than this self-torture and self mutilation Now, the artist, however, also um, shows the willpower when he or she struggles against poverty, criticism, to impose their vision of the world on these mute materials, right? Um, it's not easy to be an artist. It's not easy to be a genius. Usually these people are not very happy, they are suffering, but they still do that because they feel this sense of the need to create something. And by the way, he was a huge admirer of Dostoevsky. You read Dostoevsky, there's a lot of torture going on down there in his works, but um, Nietzsche thought that this actually does exhibit this will to power. The scientist, he would say, also is uh, somebody who shows will to power when he or she subdues a wide range of this physical phenomena and reduces them to some elegant mathematical formulas. Even the lover, the lover, um, he or she, who risks rejection in order to win the affections of the person. Like, remember the example again I was giving of myself last time? Um, yes, if you love somebody, it takes a lot to um, go ahead and tell them takes a lot to do something and he says it takes the willpower to do it so that's uh, some of the examples of willpower so then he goes into what um, he distinguishes as uh, master and slave morality now he's saying that all morality in any society is a manifestation of the will to power however there are two ways you can approach it there is master morality uh, which is driven in will, by the will to power and revels in it. And there is slave morality, which of course is also driven by the will to power, because everything is driven by the will to power, there's really nothing else driving us, but it attempts to deny this. So he's saying that um, the first example would be all these people, um, again, Christ, you can say, is one of them, because he certainly uh, exhibits this will to power to submit uh, himself to uh, his ideas and revels in it rather than the Christians who follow them according to um, Nietzsche Christianity itself is just attempts to deny uh, that will to power they attempt to um, somehow explain it away now, let's look a little bit closer.
closer to this because again this is uh, when you just hear these terms and everything and especially if you start thinking about uh, the nazis and so on it it really can lead you astray from what nietzsche truly means there and um, easy to misunderstand so again master morality you can see how somebody like hitler somebody like the nazis would um, accept that uh, and there is some point to that he's saying master morality would be values of psychologically powerful and strong-willed people now he calls it higher more noble aristocratic or elite segment of humanity Note that aristocratic, not in a sense that they have like this noble blood from their parents. To him, this is aristocratic in purely like a spiritual way. Like some people are just by nature more of aristocratic people than others. What, what kind of people are those? Uh, those who create their own values. They do not refer to social uh, status. They actually reject that. So... If you think about aristocrats, that's actually the opposite of that, right? The aristocrats in any society, they stick to those um, social roles, social status, because they benefit from that. But in this case, a person rejecting it would be master, and the person accepting it would be slave. Um, in other words, it is the person who's not following the herd, the person who um, is able to have their own stand against the world against others um, my judgment is my judgment that kind of is um, how that can be described now remember again perspectivism you're saying that we all have different perspectives but some of us are just more powerful than others in um, projecting it to other people so what exactly is good for this kind of people what is good for the strong um, Whatever leads to self-fulfillment and affirms one's sense of personal power. Now, that would be such values as nobility, strength, courage, power, and pride. This is what Nietzsche is saying, uh, values of the uh, master morality. Nobility, again, not in the sense that my dad was a count. Uh, nobility in the sense that themselves they have like this novel approach okay um, what is bad for the strong people well he would say whatever is not good that would be bad so contemptible common banal pathetic cowardly timid petty humble all of these things are bad uh, whatever shows the weakness of character that's the bad things now, what about slave morality? What does he mean by slave morality? People who are weak-willed, weak people who don't have this kind of um, willpower in themselves, and because they don't have that, they um, have no values of their own. Their values arise out of fearful, resentful reaction to the values of the strong. They hate the strong people. And so for this reason, they try to um, sub subvert them in some other way. Um, so in this case, that would be what he calls like sour grapes morality. Like, ah, oh, he's so much stronger than me. He is so much better than me. I hate him. So um, this is a quote from one of his work. I don't like him. Why? I'm not equal to him. So, in other words, he's in some way better than me. I recognize it and I hate him for this reason. Uh, now, behind that, Nietzsche is saying, is also hidden desire for power. Everybody wants power. There is will to power behind everything. But um, some people, like I said, master type is the ones who embrace it. But the... Slave type are the ones who pretend like they are not interested in that. Again, note that if you talk about Jesus, for example, Jesus did not pretend. However, why does he say many people pretend? Well, again, if you look at the uh, history of Christianity, you certainly will see a lot of people who uh, in their words are Christian, 
but they actually are again after the same thing about after power right they're trying to benefit from that like some of the popes these famous Borgia popes um, heads of the church Christianity they certainly were again um, preaching the word of Jesus which is to be meek to um, not have any uh, wealth but were they oh, of course not um, on the contrary they were living this lavish lifestyle Borgia popes are well known for being a uh, very very wealthy and enjoying it loving it loving their sense of power and everything so know that their words were completely different from their deeds their actual true philosophy is the philosophy uh, of someone who wants to achieve everything but they were trying to do that through basically propagating this weakness banking on it telling other people oh you shouldn't be wealthy you should give away all your money where would i go give it away to the church to me uh, i'm the pope so give me all your money naturally that would be an, an example now he rejects meekness in the first place even in people like jesus but he's saying at least jesus is living up to it but these people don't they pretend they want the same things as the strong people but they just try to get to that through lies through deception of others and possibly self-deception um, but this is majority of people says Nietzsche slaves do have these numbers there's a lot more people who are weak-willed than the strong people there's not many people who are truly masters um, and for this reason of course the numbers win the numbers always win so slave morality he would say that's what was driving um, such people as ancient Jews and also early Christians they could not achieve anything through their strong strength so they were again propagating these ideas of Jesus just in order to achieve something through their weakness uh, they made their weakness into a virtue so that's the idea of um, Christianity he's saying we should reevaluate all our values we should look back at them and not reject them necessarily uh, he is not saying we should reject all values like whatever you know people think is moral uh, including murder and so on immoral rather um, but we should just say oh no that's that's doesn't matter so we should go around and murder other people no Nietzsche is saying we should reevaluate them we should look at them from a different perspective we should realize that they are not given to us by a bible or whatever that we essentially are the creators of that and for this reason uh, we should question whether or not these values are valuable based again on the categories of uh, good and bad rather than good and evil so good and evil would be more of a metaphysical categories but good and bad would be more practical again remember that's just uh, like the pragmatic approach in that sense does it work for us does it make us uh, better does it help um, us to be happy and if the answer is no then that's probably not a good values he's saying then we should reject them then there's this idea of an overman um, ubermensch um, ubermensch in his later philosophy is a kind of a interesting figure it again it's a lot more um, of artistic or poetic approach than philosophical he is just talking about this figure who would be a kind of human but who would rise above human uh, he'll be the one who rise rises above mediocrity of culture and human nature to overcome human being uh, there's a striking metaphor he has in thus spoke Zaratustra one of his work uh, works man is a rope stretched between beast and overman a rope over an abyss so if you think about it um, so he means that there's this rope right on one hand there is a beast this is what we were at some point B 
beast. On the other, there is an overman. spell the whole thing so that rope is a human being he has some of the beast in him or in her and some of the overman and there is a beast underneath so if it breaks it falls down kind of a striking idea um, so what is needed in order to become an overman um, well this biological inheritance we have the cultural conditioning we have brainwashing you may say has to be overcome there's a lot of this in us um, if not everything really and it would take a lot to get above that um, again another striking metaphor from that work um, i teach you the overman man is something that shall be overcome what have you done to overcome him you can see again how that can play well with people like the Nazis, um, who probably thought of themselves as overmans. Um, nonetheless, that's not exactly what he means. He's talking about, first of all, inner strength. It's not commanding other people. It's commanding yourself. The ideal is the union of spiritual superiority. There is some spiritual in that, um, with well-being and excess of strength. So that's the person who does not need to rely on any illusions in order to be at peace with him or herself. Combination of Roman Caesar and with Christ's soul. So Roman Caesar, again, that's this figure of a strong um, national leader who leads the um, warriors, but with Christ's soul. Is this even achievable? That, that's a big question. But he's saying that is um, a goal. That person is not a conqueror. He's more of an artist. And in fact, again and again, we hear about art in connection to Nietzsche. So artists, he definitely admires artists. We already talked about it last time. Remember, life is a work of art. The idea that um, your whole life should be beautiful just like a work of art the book mentions a little bit about um, these ideas of um, apollonian and dionysian that that's his one of his very first works uh, discusses that back then he was also very impressed by schopenhauer there's a bit of schopenhauer in here he is saying that overman in particular is a unity of reason and passion unity of what can be represented by Apollo, the Greek god Apollo, reasonable god, god of reason, and Dionysius. Dionysius was this kind of god of the people who engage in this really crazy behavior, like wild parties, dancing, um, just letting it go. And that is kind of a passionate approach. So he's saying Overman would combine that reason with passion you have to have balance of them you cannot go too much into one of them in fact um, uh, what he talks about in uh, this one of his first works um, is that in greek society in particular in ancient greece the passion the dionysian side was slowly abandoned and he criticizes Greeks, and in particular, um, Socrates to him is one of these figures who embraced reason too much, put too much on reason, stepped away from passion, so he actually does not like him at all. He thinks better about Plato because he thinks Plato, being noble even by blood, was more a um, balanced person, whereas Socrates was just this vulgar, uh, simple individual who did not understand the importance of passion and try to reject it altogether, approach everything with reason only, which would lead you to this dry and pointless life. Uh, and he's saying, notably, Socrates did not like art. Uh, Socrates never talks about art. And um, even Plato, when he talks about art, he actually kind of rejects it. I don't know if you guys still remember from the first lectures, Plato was saying that um, 
poetry is just the lowest type of um, knowledge that poets and artists are just masters of illusion. And remember, illusion is um, to him on the bottom of that scale. What is on top of it, the pure thought and uh, pure knowledge of the forms, so mathematics in particular. Um, there is another quote about the overman. Human being who would be strong, highly educated, skillful in all bodily matters, self-controlled, reverent towards himself, and who might dare to afford the whole range and wealth of being, of being natural, being strong enough for such freedom. So he's strong and he enjoys that, or she, I guess. Uh, even though Nietzsche actually wasn't much of a feminist, but nonetheless, we today may say that should equally apply to a woman. But Nietzsche says, a man of tolerance, not from weakness, but from strength, uh, because he knows how to use to his, advan to his advantage even that from which the average nature would perish, the man for whom there is no longer anything that is forbidden, unless it is weakness, whether called vice or virtue. So in other words, this strong person, according to Nietzsche, would also be generous, but he would be generous, again, not from weakness, but from natural strength. He would not give anything to other people uh, because he enjoys that feeling that uh, he's stronger than them. Now that actually is a sign of weakness. He would give it because he actually is stronger than them and he knows it. It's kind of a, a thin psychological line, but nonetheless. One more important um, Nietzschean idea, myth of eternal occurrence. We actually again heard a little bit about that when we talked about ancient Greece. Um, the Greek people already had this idea. Nietzsche really embraces it. So what is the eternal recurrence? One of the most famous doctrines. So he's saying the world has this limited number of combinations, right? If the world continues infinitely, and he's saying it does. Remember, for Greek people, it was like a circle. Why circle? Because you cannot have an infinite line, but the circle is infinite. Well, it doesn't look much like a circle the way I draw it, but you got the idea. It never ends, right? But if it never ends, there's only so many different combinations thing can take, which means it repeats itself, which means the moment we live right now, well, long, 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 long time will pass. All the other possible combinations of the way the world is will be exhausted, and that moment will happen again, and again, and again, and again, infinitely. So that's the eternal recurrence. This life, as you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once more and innumerable number of times. And there will be nothing new in it, but every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh and everything unutterably small or great in your life will have to return to you, all in the same succession and sequence. Now, what does it mean for us as human beings? Um, well, that is like a not so much, he's not so much trying to uh, say this is how things really will be happening. It's more of a thought experiment again. He's trying to tell you, you should live your life if this is what will happen, right? Um, it helps you to see if you can celebrate your life, even if it has no eternal purpose. Like, yes, that, that life you live, it will be repeating itself and repeating itself and repeating itself and you should embrace it. You should embrace it as it is. It's not going to be perfect. There's nothing perfect. More than that, it will not be meaningful because nothing is meaningful. There's no meaning. Nonetheless, what he says is the most difficult part for us and what we should achieve is amor pati. Love this life for what it is. Just love it the way it is. Yes, there's no sense. Yes, there's no God. Yes, there's no purpose to anything. You gotta love it. You gotta embrace it. You gotta celebrate it. Um, with suffering, with pain, with everything which happens to you. Just be 
be thankful that it is happening. And that's all there is to it. So my formula for greatness, he says in a human being, is a morphati. That one wants nothing to be different, not in all eternity. Not merely bear what is necessary, still less conceal it, but love it. So no regrets about anything. Create your own meaning. There is no meaning other than what you create. Approach life with this attitude of an overman. Again, remember, that does not mean submissing others. That means submissing yourself. Um, create your own meaning and enjoy it. Love it. Then you will be an overman. That basically is... Um, Something which very few people can achieve, if anybody. Perhaps it's unachievable, but that, according to him, should be the goal. And that's the way to live your life. First of all, in truth, not lying to yourself about it. Uh, realizing that there's really no meaning other than what I create. But in the same time, being proud of that. Being uh, this kind of wholesome person who is able to be happy and to enjoy his or her life regardless of what is happening because bad things will happen bad things always always happen right um, you can't um, really avoid that nobody can avoid pain and suffering but um, absurdism um, I'm not sure about absurdism well that you may say it is somewhat absurd but um, it certainly is a viable philosophical position. Remember, however, he is not a um, full sense of philosopher. He is a writer. To him, the important point is to get you to think about that. Not necessarily even to live that way, but understand it. And that's already getting you somewhere. Okay, so now, um, before we conclude the class, let's talk about... First of all, the final exam. Uh, it will take place on Monday, May 10th, right? Become available at midnight between Sunday and Monday. Have to be submitted by 11.59 in order to avoid penalty. And you certainly do not want to get penalty on that one. You will still be able to submit it on Tuesday, but with 10% penalty. After 11.59 p.m. on Tuesday, May 11th, there will be no more work accepted of any kind. And remember, since it is a chance for you to improve your grade, you certainly want to prepare well and to do it on time. This is not something you want to miss. Now, let's talk about grades once again. So, uh, after the final is complete, probably like around Thursday, because it will take me some time after the last person submits it I will post the grades first I will post them on canvas as uh, I'll create an assignment called course grade and it will be a letter grade because remember class doesn't have percentages it's actually letters so what goes on your record will be the letter rather than 69% uh, or whatever how you convert percentages into letters, you can see it on the syllabus. If you look at the syllabus, it has this clear scale, what percentage means what grade. Now, at the minimum, you would get whatever you get on the final, at the minimum. So, if you do get something like 100% on the final, you are guaranteed to get an A in class, no matter what other grades you have. Is it possible for you to get a better grade on the in the course, then you have what you have on the final. Yes, it is possible. I mean, some people get a C on the final, but they already have so many points that they can qualify for a B. Maybe not for an A, but at least for a B. I'll give you a B. I'll give you whatever is higher, right? So if you are able to do better on the final, that will be a grade. If you are not able to do what is better on your final, then I'll just assign you a grade based on your total points plus extra credit again extra credit can add up to 10 percent so do not be surprised uh, if your grade is better than you expect because that's another thing i don't know why would anybody worry about that but i do sometimes get uh, this kind of messages from people who like for example have 
I don't know, 89% and then they get an A. And they're like, why did they get an A? That should be like a B plus. Well, you got an A because you had extra credit in addition to that. And um, it's up to 10%, right? So it moved you up. On the other hand, of course, if you don't have any extra credit, then it's certainly not going to change. So in that case, you will get exactly what um, your percentage suggests. And if you have 89%, that will be a B plus and not even A minus. Okay, um, so again, this is all letter grades. What happens if you really are unhappy with your letter grade? If you're really unhappy, there's an option to request pass-fail grade. We talked about it before. Let me emphasize. I do not assign pass-fail grades. I will assign you a letter grade. If you're unhappy, I think they said May 16th is the first day you can actually uh, submit to the department petition to change your grade to pass fail. So in other words, if you have less than a C, they'll give you fail. If you have more than a C, they'll give you pass. Uh, pass means you will still have credit for this class, but not a letter grade. And if you get fail, then you will have to retake it, but it's not going to affect your GPA in either case, because that's one of the benefits of pass fail doesn't go into your GPA. So who may be interested in that? For example, you are a great student, you get constant A's, and you get a C in this class. Well, you don't want to waste the credit, right? Because C is still a passing grade, but you also don't want it on your record. So then you may want to request pass grade rather than C, and that will keep your GPA intact. On the other hand, if you got a D or whatever in the class, um, you may want to retake it anyway, but you don't want it to affect your GPA either, so then you may want to request fail, because otherwise it will affect your GPA, it will pull it down. Now, once again, do not do it without talking to the college advisor, because that can affect your financial aid, it can affect other things. If you want this option, contact your college advisor. If you don't have one, just contact the office uh, college advisors, they will assign you somebody, you will discuss it with them, and then they will look at your record, they'll look at your financial aid, they know all the rules, and they'll give you advice. So if they think it's a good idea, you can go ahead, petition the department, and have your letter grade change to pass fail. But once again, I have nothing to do with it, so do not email me, do not message me about that. That's your decision between you and your advisor in the department. I can only give you letter grades. That's all I can do. And it's always based on the work you did. Okay. Uh, so this is basically then all we have for this class. I do want to ask you guys because I'm curious whether you enjoyed it or not. And um, I want to maybe improve this. So first of all, let's do a little poll. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, but let's see what you think. Um, a, B, C options. A would be I enjoyed the class and would take it again. Uh, B would be I enjoyed it, but I would not take it again. I guess that's in case if you think class was good, but it's just not a very interesting subject for you in general. And finally, C would be I did not particularly enjoy it. So let's see um, what you think. You can feel free to vote. I'm not going to punish anybody for <laughs> saying you don't enjoy it because I understand like not everybody enjoys philosophy and so on, but I'm just curious what would be the result. Okay, anybody else? There's still, yeah, there's still a few people if you want to vote again you don't have to but um, just out of curiosity I want to see what's going on with that okay so a few more seconds and we should publish it I'm not going to name any names in fact I'm not even looking at the names so make sure that you understand I'm not I'm not taking notes oh you didn't like it <laughs> no I, I'm just curious okay so seven people said um, that you did enjoy it four people said um, enjoyed it but would not take it again and nobody said that you didn't enjoy it well i hope that um yeah that everybody enjoyed it and you 
have some good stuff you picked up from it. It always hurts me when students leave feedback and say that they did not enjoy it uh, because like last semester there was somebody who on myprofessor.com wrote that they did not think I myself uh, enjoyed teaching it. Well, hopefully if you guys uh, were here, you know that actually that's not true at all. It's like fundamentally not true. I certainly love philosophy and I love teaching it. And um, unfortunately I try to do my best, but I know that in general, there's more dissatisfied people now that it is taught online because it's a difficult class to teach online. It's not um, at all like 102, where, which is more kind of mathematical type of thing. You need more interaction with students. And for this reason, by the way, next semester, when we're back into classroom, at least partially, there's quite a few um, Philosophy 101 classes which will be taught um, by a variety of professors in the classroom, including me, fully in the classroom. Why? Because that's this kind of a class. But uh, for 102, not as many, in fact, very few. Uh, because 102 not, does not require as much personal interaction as 101. Anyway, um, we still have a little bit of time. Any kind of questions or concerns or anything you guys want to ask, go ahead and ask that, because like I said, that's the last time we meet. If there's anything still unclear, if there are any comments you want to make, You'll also get a chance to do this teacher evaluation. I don't know if you got the email yet. You should get an email, do it online. Um, it asks you to leave the comments there. So again, I encourage you to do that because sometimes these comments are very helpful. I actually do get to read them after I assign the grades because they don't want me to uh, you know, get prejudiced or anything, even though there are no names either. There's just those comments, but I can see those comments and I take them into consideration too, because if students uh, raise certain issues, then I adjust the way I teach the class so that everybody would be able to uh, enjoy it, hopefully. So anything at all? Anything comes to mind? Thank you, Maria. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Yes, there's only so much again you can do online, but hopefully I um, tried to do my best and hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Hopefully we will go back into classrooms, which certainly gives more of a, a personal way to interact. And again, feel free to take one or two with me if you need it. Um, and if you don't, then I guess you don't. Okay, well, Unless there is any other questions, I suppose we can wrap it up. You can always message me if they think of something else. Um, take final very seriously. I definitely advise you to take it seriously. It's really a good chance for all of you uh, to improve your grade. And I want to see more good grades. I don't want to assign bad grades. I do when I have to, because that's you know how it works, but nonetheless, I would much rather give you a good grade than bad one. It pains me to give anybody uh, bad grades. Thank you very much. Uh, it was my pleasure teaching this class, and I guess with that we can uh, adjourn.